Did you know that a charmingly sweet sports movie starring Anthony Hopkins of all people is available to watch on YouTube? Oh yeah, it's also free. Curious to know what it is? Keep watching for this title and 23 more. Few war stories are as harrowing as All Quiet on the Western Front, and its start grim grace comes across perfectly in this 1979 television film. The movie follows young Paul Baumer alongside his friends and his comrades in arms through their World War I service. Paul enters the war full of romantic idealism, his passion for a noble quest stoked by a teacher who, notably, has no plans to volunteer for the fight. He soon learns the bloody and bitter reality of war, which he experiences as a grinding, pointless horror. His bond with some of his fellow soldiers provides the only bright spot, and that becomes its own torment as his friends die off all around him. They've amputated my leg. Could be worse. The film is obviously bleak, but it's also beautifully crafted. Furthermore, the acting helps convey the staggering human cost of the war, magnifying the movie's effectiveness. It's painful to watch, but it's worth it. This early slasher is a dark, atmospheric masterpiece. Black Christmas features an incredible cast full of familiar faces, including Olivia Hussey, Margot Kidder, and horror icon John Saxon. Given its solid cast, the film creates characters who are richer and more realistic than the stalk and stash norm. Olivia Hussey stars as Jess, a serious young woman in the midst of a personal crisis. On top of that, her sorority house keeps getting obscene phone calls. The more jaded girls can dismiss and even ridicule the unknown caller's heavy breathing and grotesque advances, but he soon escalates to wild shrieks, different voices, and threats of murder. He's expanded his act. When sweet, responsible Claire turns up missing, it kicks off a police investigation, one that eventually reveals part of the terrifying mystery behind the phone calls. While time has lessened the impact of the biggest twist in Black Christmas, it definitely hasn't diminished the film's deftly handled characterization, well-incorporated humor, moody atmosphere, and strong sense of place. So what about the scares? Put it this way, there are scenes and images here that will have a permanent place in your nightmares. You'll never think of a plastic bag the same way again. The ending is the perfect ambiguous cherry on top. Over the years, the film has become a cult horror classic that's popular with fans and critics alike. It's earned both a spot on Bravo's list of scariest movie moments and retrospective articles praising its feminist overtones. When conspiracy theorists insist that the moon landing was all an elaborate, well-funded hoax, there's one movie they like to point to, Capricorn One, a paranoid 70s thriller where NASA strong-arms its astronauts into faking a Mars mission just so the money keeps flowing. We do not claim this planet in the name of America. We claim it in the name of all the people of the planet Earth. Obviously, the moon landing was real, and Capricorn One is absolutely fiction. In spite of its lackluster early reviews, however, the film is a satisfying and well-constructed thriller with a strong cast that includes heavy hitters like Hal Holbrook, Karen Black, and Elliot Gould. Fans of movies like The Parallax View should certainly check it out. The 1985 television adaptation of Death of a Salesman made an impressive showing at the Emmys, collecting an award for its art direction as well as outstanding acting in a miniseries or special awards for Dustin Hoffman and John Malkovich, as well as a whole slew of nominations. The story is a small-scale tragedy of traveling salesman Willie Loman, whose dreams of success have never really come to fruition. I'm going off the road. Willie is slipping into senility and his family is struggling to deal with it, even as he heaps judgment upon them. His relationship with his sons, Happy and Biff, takes center stage as the young men grapple with the weight of his expectations. The original play is a classic for a reason, and this remarkably strong adaptation makes you feel like you're seeing it performed live, and by some of the best actors of the last few decades. If you like kaiju movies, you should know in advance that Destroy All Monsters isn't just one of the best kaiju movies, it's also one of the most kaiju movies, featuring an epic clash of 11 separate monsters. The king of all mashups takes place after all known kaiju have been safely confined to Monster Island, where scientists and researchers can study them. Unfortunately, when aliens start mind-controlling the scientists, this means it's all too easy for them to unleash the monsters on the world. Cities will fall until Earth gives in. Needless to say, people don't give up that easily, and soon it's a battle of our monsters against their monsters. Destroy All Monsters provides plenty of kaiju action and satisfaction, while also fully acknowledging that, since this is the ninth Godzilla movie, everyone is really fond of these guys by now and don't want to see them go down. The Endless is an ambitious and beautiful sci-fi horror film that makes the most of its modest budget. Instead of pure spectacle, you get thoughtful and innovative chills. The movie is a companion piece to Resolution, also by directors Justin Benson and Aaron Moorhead. The two films enrich each other, but they can both be watched as standalones. Of the two, The Endless is a shade more complex. It concentrates on two brothers, Justin and Aaron, who have lived marginal and unsatisfying lives ever since Justin forced them to break away from the Camp Arcadia, the cult they grew up in. 
Aaron misses the easy life, camaraderie, and sense of belonging, and when he and Justin receive a video from Camp Arcadia, he seizes on the excuse to go back for at least a brief visit. Once there, the tension between the brothers amps up, with Aaron embracing the place while Justin can't stop wondering about all its impossibilities. Why doesn't anyone there seem to age? Why is there a second moon in the sky? Who or what is leaving them photographs and videos, and what does it all mean? The answers are clever and sometimes terrifying, especially in the scene where Justin finds people who are also trapped in the area, but not having an idyllic Camp Arcadia experience. This is a movie that will linger long after its credits roll. Four Lions is a dark and daring satirical thriller, with plenty of politically sharp criticism of both its fanatical would-be terrorists and the world that rouses their ire. Security guard Omar, played by Riz Ahmed, and his friends are frustrated, angry, committed, idealistic, and sometimes incredibly confused and incompetent. They want to express their beliefs to the world explosively. There's just one complication. They're not exactly the most talented terrorists in the world. Just as a start, they have trouble picking targets, and let's just say that their skills with handling explosives could use a little fine-tuning. Equal parts exciting and insightful, Four Lions takes a lot of risks and makes them pay off in spades. Chloe is just a little girl, but that wouldn't matter to the dangerous government agency that keeps an eye out for abnormals and tries to capture or kill them. Both her parents and grandfather are abnormals. No wonder her justifiably paranoid father Henry, who can slow time, always tries to keep her inside and out of sight. He wants to give her a normal life someday, but he's terrified that she'll meet the same fate as her mother, who is imprisoned in Matic Mountain by the ruthless abnormal defense squad. Will Henry's chances of keeping Chloe safe fall apart when she makes it into the outside world? I promise I'll listen to you. I won't go outside. Moreover, is there any hope of rescuing her mother? The superpower elements are well considered and an immediate draw, but it's how Freaks handles them with skilled acting, personal stakes, and realism that really makes the movie something special. Gizmodo's review emphasizes the film's delightful combination of science fiction and heart, saying, The directors stuff freaks with limitless imagination, finding ways to execute their loftier ambitions. It's a film filled with complex, robust ideas that not only have a unique twist to them, but a realistic grounding that makes them more relatable and impactful. 1954's original Godzilla is a classic for a reason. The film features smooth storytelling, strong pacing, great early creature effects and costuming, and a moving sense of how cooperation and insight can help save the day, and sometimes create new risks. Most of all, it has a powerful subtext about the profound cost of nuclear warfare and experimentation. It's not just a good, fun movie, it's a meaningful one that really resonates with people. Godzilla is the descendant of a prehistoric sea creature, and it's now evolved enough to walk on land, much to humanity's dismay. Newly awakened by nuclear testing, Godzilla is now rampaging around and across Japan, destroying ships and villages and withstanding everything the country tries to throw at him. It's easy to see why the movie has aged so well, as Time Out put it. More so than in the jokey sequels, this film's Godzilla comes off as a potent and provocative metaphor, a lumbering embodiment of atomic age anxieties birthed from mankind's own desire to destroy. Godzilla is pop art as Purge. Dan Harmon's Community has long been one of TV's most celebrated comedies. The documentary Harmontown, like the podcast it springs from, takes the lid off the show's creator and shows you what's underneath. Uh, this is it. We don't, yeah, we don't, we don't prepare. Actually, Harmon himself takes the lid off himself. Over the course of Harmontown, he reveals his gifts, insecurities, and issues at a particularly vulnerable time in his life, right after he was fired from his own show and set adrift for its fourth season. Did you did you see it coming that you were going to be uh, like fired? I always joked about it. Yeah. Uh, maybe I maybe they got the idea from me. Needing to get a handle on a temporarily community-free life, Harmon went on the road with his podcast and did the rambly live shows that are shown here. It's nice to see Harmon at work, but the truth is that the draw here is less the content he makes and more the man himself. It's not just a kind of sprawling comedy special, it's also a searching psychological examination. A lot is written about difficult artists, but it's rare that one gets this kind of warm but open and unsentimental showcase. This is all a lie. As a romantic comedy, I Could Never Be Your Woman may be a little uneven, but how can we resist when it boasts two of the most likable stars in existence, Michelle Pfeiffer and Paul Rudd? Thrown an early, stunningly talented appearance by the great Saoirse Ronan and put director Amy Heckerling of Clueless fame at the helm and you're all set for movie night. Ugh, as if! Pfeiffer plays TV executive Rosie Hansen, who runs a show called You Go Girl. Rosie is 40 and a business that often prefers women under 30, and it's making her self-conscious. It also gets in the way of her new romance with the playful Adam, a breakout star on her show and one who is 11 years younger than she is. Adam doesn't think their age difference is a big deal, but Rosie can't stop worrying that it's the death knell for their relationship. 
Her insecurity is definitely not helped by her scheming secretary, who goes to some extreme lengths to egg on Rosie's worries and get them to split up. The Illusionist came out in 2006, so it got overshadowed by Christopher Nolan's The Prestige. Now that the two historical magician movies are no longer competing for the same ticket sales, though, it's fine to call off the duel and admit that both are well worth watching. The Illusionist takes place in 19th century Vienna, where a magician named Eisenheim, played by Edward Norton, rises from poor, obscure origins to national fame. However, his celebrity comes too late, and by the time he's wealthy enough to be a suitable match for his true love, Sophie, played by Jessica Biel, she's already engaged to the vicious crown prince Leopold, played by Rufus Sewell. Sophie loves Eisenheim and fears Leopold, but she doesn't have much choice in her marriage. Trying to break it off results in a horror that pits Eisenheim against Leopold in an elaborate public and illusion-filled battle for justice that has to be mediated by Chief Inspector Ohl, played by Paul Giamatti. Roger Ebert notes that The Illusionist succeeds mostly because of its terrific quartet of central performances, and he reserves special praise for Giamatti, writing, His expressions and line readings alone are worth the price of admission, as they convey all's uncomfortable position on the horns of a devilish dilemma, or his Holmesian delight in assembling another section of the picture puzzle. If you're a martial arts fan who has somehow missed 2008's hit Ip Man and its sequels, you need to get to YouTube immediately to soak up all the spectacularly choreographed action. If you're not into martial arts, then you'll be pleased to know that Ip Man doubles as an engrossing biopic with a talented and charismatic star. For those who don't know, Ip Man was a Wing Chun master, a humble but incredibly gifted martial artist who would eventually go on to teach Bruce Lee himself. His early years are brought to incredibly vivid life by Donnie Yen, whose performance here takes Ip through the dangers and difficulties of the Chinese-Japanese conflict in World War II. The film doesn't stint on the horrors he has to witness and endure, but the focus here is on how, despite everything, it persists in showing his skill and character. Some of his feats may be a little exaggerated, but they're always deliciously cinematic. There are, of course, numerous Jane Eyre adaptations, but we'll always have a soft spot for 1997's TV film adaptation starring Samantha Morton and Kieran Hines, two consistently great performers who are at their best here. It is, as review site The Silver Petticoat notes, an extremely, even brutally, condensed adaptation, one that pairs a thick novel down to a mere 108 minutes. When adaptations are this plentiful, though, different approaches are welcome. You will find more faithful and comprehensive takes elsewhere, but this one takes risks that pay off. One of the most controversial aspects is Hines' more abrasive Mr. Rochester. Hines eschews an overtly romantic approach until Rochester really begins to soften towards Jane, and while his less attractive beginning rankled a few fans, it makes the romantic payoff incredibly satisfying. This Jane and Rochester are unabashedly flawed and human, and it works. If you throw me out of this house, then I will pound against the door until you let me in. Don't you understand? Beautiful, delicate, and painful, The Miseducation of Cameron Post is an LGBTQ-themed coming-of-age drama about a young girl sent to a fundamentalist gay conversion therapy center. Cameron doesn't want to be at God's promise, and she pushes back against the center's stance that her sexual orientation is sinful, wrong, and misguided. She strives to maintain a sense of self while dealing with a process designed to grind her down. And her one real refuge is her friendship with Jane and Adam, two other center misfits. While Cameron goes through some heartbreaking romantic struggles, it's hard to fall in love with someone afraid to openly love you back, the main focus here is on the sense of community she finds and how it enables her to survive her time in a fundamentally harmful institution. The classic family drama on Golden Pond is realistic, warm, and human, and it isn't afraid to wear its heart on its sleeve and risk being called sentimental. It's possible that a lesser cast might make it tip over into being a cheap tearjerker, but that's not a problem when you have Katherine Hepburn, Henry Fonda, and Jane Fonda as your central trio. Hepburn and Fonda play aging married couple Ethel and Norman Thayer, who are trying to have one more lovely, relaxed summer at Golden Pond. That prospect is interrupted and complicated by their adult daughter Chelsea, who arrives at the cottage with a new fiancé and teenage soon-to-be stepson in tow. Chelsea has a complicated relationship with her father, who she feels tries to control her life, but she needs her parents to watch 13-year-old Billy while she and his father are traveling. The summer becomes an opportunity for everyone to connect, mature, and embrace fleeting joys. Paris Je T'aime is an endearing anthology film that creates a lovely mosaic of Paris. The lengthy list of directors, 22 in all, is excellent and genre-spanning, incorporating everyone from Joel and Ethan Cohen to Wes Craven. Their segments have the same kind of variety, switching easily from drama to comedy and from the supernatural to the realistic. All anthology films are unavoidably a little uneven, and it's likely that some stories will work for you and some won't. But all in all, this provides plenty of wit, affection, and a sense of magic. The movie also makes the most of its short segments, with each story confined to a tight five minutes that, according to Empire, are handled with uncommon grace. The best segment may be the final one directed by Alexander Payne. 
where the always great Margot Martindale plays an American tourist who, in the words of critic Josh Larson, gradually transforms from a clown to an intimate, sympathetic figure. It's expertly handled by both actress and director, and it makes for a wonderful send-off. The Japanese monster movie Pantheon wouldn't be complete without 1956's Rodan. In this kaiju classic, nuclear testing brings back a number of immense prehistoric creatures, most notably the fearsome Rodan. Rodan hatches inside a mine and soon begins laying waste to modern society just by following its instincts. For a while, it has a considerable advantage. No one knows what it is. Both Rodan and its mate keep getting misconstrued as some kind of aircraft, with eyewitnesses unable to make sense of these enormous winged creatures. Soon enough, though, humanity rallies and, with clever use of an active volcano, battles back against the beasts. Like King Kong and Godzilla himself, Rodan has a kind of pathos. It's not malicious, it's just a creature that, thanks to troubling human experiments, has awoken in the wrong era. That angle is pivotal to the movie's success because, as TCM notes, it deepens the fun. The result is a monster movie with both heart and thought behind it. Walter Hill helms this action-packed thriller about a National Guard squad lost and overwhelmed in a Louisiana swamp. The film stars two terrific actors, Keith Carradine as PFC Spencer and Powers Booth as Corporal Harden. The men are grounded, reasonable, and often appealingly cynical, but their squad is mostly unskilled and trigger-happy, and there's no way to avoid getting dragged into that kind of trouble. If I was you all, I quit acting quiet in the hall ass. When the soldiers first commandeer canoes belonging to some of the locals and then jokingly aggravate them by firing blanks, the situation escalates to violence, and it only worsens from there. Soon, the men realize that as long as there is a chance the National Guard members will report the murders, the locals have no intention of letting them leave the swamp alive. Hill's commitment and the actor's naturalism lets the story go where it wants. Barbara Stanwyck gives one of her best performances in Stella Dallas, a beautifully performed and psychologically complex 1937 melodrama. Stella is a brash, working-class woman who dreams of climbing out of her assigned role in life and entering into the world of glamour, money, and privilege. She's not afraid to stoop to blatant fortune-hunting in her quest, either. That's how she lands Stephen Dallas, who marries her only because his real love is out of reach. I doubt myself. Give up a few things. Well, what have I been doing ever since I met you? Their life together is mostly unhappy, and Stella can never pass for a natural member of the elite world she's married into, but the relationship transforms her forever by giving her a daughter, Laurel. Stella's devotion to Laurel is genuine and unselfish, and it completely overhauls her priorities. She goes from focusing on her own social advancement to designing strategies to make Laurel's life as easy and happy as possible. The only problem is that she gradually starts to suspect that she will always be too unsophisticated to belong in the future she wants for Laurel. In fact, her role as Laurel's mother might even keep that future from happening at all. Tag is bizarre, beautiful, and confounding, and it builds the huge revelations and a spectacular climax. The heroine is an ordinary high school student who is seemingly doomed to be the sole survivor of multiple gory and fantastical events. She's surrounded by other girls who get cut down like weeds while she keeps going, even flickering through multiple realities and scenarios. Finding a way out of her predicament means finding an action so unexpected that it defies fate and effectively breaks the rule of the universe. And the movie doesn't stop there. Tag is what happens when you blend Inception with Sucker Punch, and anyone intrigued by that description is in for a treat. The smart, adrenaline-fueled Train to Busan might be one of the best zombie movies. It offers a nearly unbeatable combination of vivid characters and zombie mayhem, and the tight setting, the aforementioned Train to Busan, is a great gimmick that ups the tension and gives the action a unique framework. There's really nothing bad here, and the movie ties it all together with some strong emotional storytelling involving the various families on board. Critic Josh Larson singled out the film's camera work as a particularly important element, writing, it takes precise advantage of this confined space, emphasizing the survivor's limited options. As Larson points out, this brilliant use of setting allows Train to Busan to deliver a, quote, cleverly concentrated shot of zombie terror. Retching struggles over child custody are just as current and affecting now as they were in 1897, when Henry James published his classic novel What Maisie Knew. And this 2012 adaptation updates the story setting while keeping its pain, insight, and emotional resonance. Maisie is the quiet six-year-old daughter of Beale and Susanna, two phenomenally selfish and self-involved people who spend much of their marriage at each other's throats. When they split up, Maisie's living situation becomes a kind of tug-of-war rope in a game neither really wants to win. They both just want each other to lose. In fact, the two people in the movie who genuinely care about Maisie and attempt to look after her are her step-parents, Lincoln and Margot. They're the only ones who don't lose track of Maisie's best interests in the midst of all this one-upmanship and relationship turmoil. Remaking a new kind of family out of the ashes of the old may be the best route forward. 
As hard as it is to watch such an evocative portrayal of a child's emotional agony, there's a light at the end of the tunnel, and that factor, plus the brilliant performances, make it easy to recommend what Maisie knew. The World's Fastest Indian is a sweet, down-to-earth sports film that thrives on the charming lead performance of Anthony Hopkins. Since some of Hopkins' best roles have been imposing charismatic villains, it's easy to forget just how good he can be on a small scale. Here he's Bert, an eccentric elderly motorbike enthusiast, one who has already established a kind of fame at home in New Zealand and now wants to take on America, in particular the race at the Bonneville Salt Flats. You know, at uh, Bonneville, things go real fast. Circumstances, including his own health, keep conspiring against him, but Bert soldiers on. Crank it, Bert! Come on, go, go, go! The movie has a pleasant, episodic structure, with Bert's long road trip punctuated not only by his various obstacles, but also by the various allies he makes along the way, giving us plenty of gently endearing portraits of a wide cast of characters. Effectively, this is a heartwarming, quirky travelogue with a gratifying sports movie ending. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite movies are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.